I'd like to pass now to um, Dr. Schild to talk about the, the sort of the wider regional context and anything else he fancies within his um, allotted time. So, Andreas, over to you. Well, uh, Jean, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I need two things to support my voice because I got a very bad cold and I fear you won't understand me. So um, I need pictures and I need the mic. Sorry for that. So uh, to start with what I'm uh, doing, I'm uh, referring to knowledge I have gained when I was with ISIMOD. I left ISIMOD by the end of last year. So uh, when I say here ISIMOD, I'm uh, not anymore with ISIMOD. I have left it and uh, I'm now a private person. Now, what I'm saying is also based on a more comprehensive uh, study on, on, a, on a series of study and I have brought with me a summary of this study which uh, those who are interested please help yourself. It's a, a paper which has been presented in Durban during the last COP, uh, COP meeting and it is a summary of 24 scientific papers from the region on what means climate change in uh, South Asia. Now. Um, I'm trying to focus now um, on some issues because I have 20, 20 minutes and I would uh, like to focus on water and maybe on uh, pollution to a certain extent. Let's see how far we reach. Now, I'm, I have a very particular perspective, namely the perspective of mountains, because uh, when um, um, we heard about uh, the UNFCC process and the IPCC report, we have to say that the mountains, especially in Asia, have virtually not been mentioned. And because we have a very fragmented and very limited knowledge. I can quote you an example, or you could, can quote it for me. How much ice surface do we have in Asia, in the Hindu Kush Himalaya? Does anyone have a figure in mind? You see, two years ago, this has been a big controversy. Because the IPCC report number four in 2007 speaks of 500,000 square kilometers of ice. And then we talk, of course, of the third pole. Now, we have made an analysis of all the glaciers of the Hindu Kush Himalaya beyond 0 0.2 square kilometers. And we arrive at 60,000 square kilometers of glaciated area in the Himalayas. So what I mean with this is you see the gap of knowledge we are having on basic things. What has happened in the Alps, namely that there has been research on glaciers and mountains since the 19th centuries, has not happened in the Himalayas. There have been individual researchers going there, but the governments colonial powers, but also the post-colonial powers, they didn't consider mountains as a priority for research. The high Himalayas were of strategic importance for the government of India and for the army and not for research. So this is affecting actually the knowledge and we are being punished uh, by this today. Now we are talking of the Hindu Kush Himalaya, you see here a satellite picture, uh, and here uh, in form of a map. Uh, what I would like to emphasize is not just the mountains as a mountain system, but the upstream-downstream relationship. What we have here, the green area, is what we would call the mountain and hill areas, with some 200, 210 million people. If we include the blue areas, we have a population of 1.5 billion. In other words, what we are doing here and what we are looking at is not just a mountain and a kind of an alpine problem. It is really a regional problem. And you see here, the uh, ten major rivers of Asia are having their origin in the Hindu Kush Himalaya. Now, we have to be aware, and um, I'm glad to see that there is uh, a research going on, on how is, mountain, how is climate change being perceived? We have to be aware that for the people in the Hindu Kush Himalaya, climate change is not the only issue. We have to be aware that globalization, that migration, uh, the development of communication are issues which are having a very direct impact. And we have to consider climate change as an add-on, as rather something 
slow, which is creeping in and having long-term effects. But when I show you here this example is, we are talking always of foreign aid. Now, foreign aid are the green colors. The blue colors are the remittances of labor, of workers from the Himalayan countries, from the countries of South Asia, the remittances they're getting from foreign labor. So today, the problem in the Himalaya is not overpopulation and overuse of resources. The problem of the Himalayas is to have the manpower to deal with the resources in a sustainable way. So we should forget what we have been talking about or thinking for 30 years. Some mountain uh, communities have problems to, to bury their dead because they don't have enough man in the village. So there are very concrete problems, but they have problems to bring in their harvest in the autumn because the male population is in the Middle East for working. So in a, I, with this, I don't want to diminish and to reduce the problem of climate change, but we have to be aware that when we talk to people, very often there are more immediate and more imposing problems which are there for them, which are changing their daily life. Uh, now, when we come to climate change, we have certain things where everybody agrees, which are clear. And um, it is, of course, the uh, temperatures which are growing, which are growing in the mountains more than in the plains. We have uh, very clearly, uh, statistically clear, higher temperatures in the mountains uh, than in the low areas. Well, relatively, they are growing quicker than in the uh, low areas. Now, another phenomenon where we agree is we have a tendency to have less rainy days during monsoon. You are aware that in South Asia, weather is conditioned by the, the Indian monsoon. So we have less rainy days, but more intensive rains. This is also uh, in the statistics in the last um, 50 years is, is clear. Uh, this is consequence of climate change. Um, now, what does it mean in terms of observation? Here, this is a picture you might have seen already. It shows a very impressive glacier of 1956 and the same glaciers in 2007. The glacier has disappeared and been replaced by a, a two and a half kilometer long lake. So we have now 54,000 lakes in the Himalayas, which are growing which are changing, uh, which are the result of melting glaciers. However, most of this water is kept back by the moraine and is creating lakes. However, the problem we have with climate change is that the moraine, which is actually uh, a solid uh, uh, combination of, of earth and and, and rock is solid as long as we have permafrost. Climate change means that the permafrost is disappearing and with this the stability of all these lakes. So that is one of the uh, hazards we are having. Now, when I talk of glaciers, uh, even there, uh, I was mentioning the uh, IPCC report number four, but frankly speaking, we don't have long-term research in the Himalayas on the glaciers. So there's a lot of talk what it means. And most of the information, here you see these blue squares, are actually made based on observation of the terminus of the snout of the, snout of the, of the glacier. It says when you go and see a glacier and say, ah, the glacier has receded, it's, it has gone back, or it has a little bit advanced. Scientifically, not very relevant because Relevant, of course, is to know, has the, the mass of ice changed? How has it changed? And this uh, can change according to the uh, geology and so on. So we have here only the red ones, where it, which have some data on uh, mass balancing. These data are partly coming from China. They were the first ones uh, doing uh, mass balancing. They have done it in Central Asia, in uh, Xinjiang. On the big Himalayan glaciers, we have started with mass balancing only a few years ago. In other words, we don't have the information 
necessary to have a clear statement. Now you have maybe read in Nature, uh, I think three weeks ago there was a report uh, published by Colorado, uh, by Boulder, Colorado, saying that uh, the melting of the glaciers has been reduced based on satellite observation by GRACE satellite. Again, this is a satellite observation which is important However, the experience shows that you have to combine a satellite and a remote sensing with in-field in-situ research, which is very difficult in the Himalayas. Now, to make things more complicated, we have glaciers in the Himalayas which are growing. And here, this is a map of uh, Karakorum, which is in uh, northern uh, Pakistan. And here, we have some of the glaciers which are even searching, which are growing very strongly. And what, how can this be explained? And the reason is probably climate change, because we realize that the Karakorum is getting much more precipitation in April uh, through winter westerlies, and which uh, were very weak before, which have become more intensive. And we think also that the monsoon is less intensive in, Western, uh, in northern Pakistan. And this is giving more, more precipitation in winter, especially between five and 7,000 meters. And we have such situations where you have tremendous buildup in the mountains, and you have glaciers which are conti continuously fed by avalanches from above 7,000 meters. And here in the Western Himalayas, you have the lowest glacier is at 2,400 meters. It means it's melting very rapidly in the bottom of the valley, but it is still growing because it's being pushed from, from ahead. So you see, you have a contradicting picture, which is also due to climate change, but um, some skeptics will say, yeah, but I have seen a glacier which is growing. So, which is true, but it doesn't say anything about climate change. Now, more relevant, actually, is the cover of uh, the snow cap. Now, with the snow cap, we have another problem. You see, I'm showing here the picture of only eight years back. And here, we have a very funny situation. The red ones have increased the snow color, and the blue ones are reducing. So we realize that in the eastern Himalaya, the snow cover has increased. And in the central Himalayas, it has substantially decreased. Now, we have only eight years, so from the science point of view, it's difficult to interpret it. We couldn't do it any longer because we couldn't use the same method. That was, that was the reason. Now, but this information is very relevant because it is influencing very much the discharge of the rivers from the melting uh, moment onwards, because that's where it is most useful and most important for the, for the irrigation. Now, when we see again the water situation, especially in South Asia, we have, uh, in the years to come, whether we have climate change or not, we have a strong demand, a growing demand for water, and we have a growing demand for agricultural purposes. So this is, um, very different from other parts of the world, even in South East, Southeast Asia, the demand for households, for industry is higher than for agriculture. In South Asia, it's mainly agriculture. And we have in South Asia already an overview use of the water resources. Um, so uh, we have to see the situation. Now, with climate change, if you put this in addition to that, we realize we have more, more water during monsoon, we have less water during the dry season. So we are going to face more and more of this situation where we have um, an extended and growing dry season and a more intensive wet season where we have floods. And we have generally a reduction of the runoff and of course with this uh, growing social conflicts. Now when I show you this picture, this is uh, showing the intensity of irrigation in the um, Piedemonte, in the lowlands before the Himalayas. If you would see, uh, look at the global map, you would see that this is the most intensive irrigated area of the globe. And what it means, if we don't have any more, the regular discharge of Himalayan waters, it means that this irrigation is not going to work. The replenishment of the ground uh, water uh, 
level is, is not possible. And we have here, especially also the Indus, where we realize that during the whole year, the Indus River is depending to 46% of snow and glacier melt, much higher than the others. Uh, in, uh, Ganges is some, something between 6 to 7%. But Indus, it's 47% uh, and during high season, it's 75%. So what is happening in terms of climate change, water discharge, is not just a mountain issue. It is a, an issue of food security, because this is the food basket of Asia and is the basis of social stability in, in South Asia, but also in, in North Asia, in China. Now, according to um, uh, the International Food Research Institute, um, they have made projection and they, they are saying that due to climate change and the non-availability of water, the agricultural productivity in South Asia will be reduced by 18 to 22 percent. They are just considering water and not the other issues. I'm coming back to that. So we have a dramatic uh, situation which is being accompanied by growing conflicts and political problems. That's what we have to see in a, a prospective way. Now, the immediate uh, consequence of this situation is uh, the growing uh, disasters. We have already now very clearly, um, as I said, more water during uh, monsoon time. We have more disasters and we have more droughts. And this is now, for instance, for the government of India, but also for the government of Bangladesh, are very dramatic issues. Now, when we see this, this is a, is a world map, we see that the South Asian countries are by far the most vulnerable to, uh, to these floods, because floods in South Asia means immediately enormous damage of goods and human, uh, human beings, much more than uh, any, anywhere else. Now, um, I would like not to continue here, but I, I would be interested to, in the discussion maybe to link this also with the IPCC reports and the UNFCC uh, uh, debates uh, which are taking place. But I would like to draw your attention to another issue which is not yet very familiar, but which is more and more uh, concerning. It is not just the greenhouse gases, but it is the influence of uh, the brown, brown cloud. We have here a, a satellite picture, uh, Ganges Valley, which shows that there is a certain haze which is established, which means that the, the solar light is being filtered and it has a cooling effect. But it has also the effect that the sunlight is not reaching the agricultural plants. According to certain studies in China, this means a reduction of productivity from 5 to 10 percent. Now, this uh, brown cloud is actually transported uh, globally by the jet stream, and partly it is composed by elements from, uh, from, uh, from Asia, from, uh, from North America, and, and from elsewhere. It's a very complicated phenomenon. So this is uh, a, a, a phenomenon which is being uh, analyzed, and Professor Ramanathan is uh, one of the leading uh, persons who is looking at that. But as I said, we have not yet sufficient uh, data um, on, on the ground. Now, another phenomenon which um, has uh, called for public attention, uh, especially by a UNEP report last year, is uh, black carbon. What means black carbon? Black carbon is actually soot. It is the product of incomplete combustion of organic material. Now, this black carbon is having a very important effect, especially in Asia, because uh, in Asia um, we have increasing uh, urbanization, we have diesel, but especially also in the Himalayas, we have a lot of household uh, cooking, which is done with organic material. Now, the measures which we have, and this is a picture of, um, of Nainital, uh, the Manora Peak, it shows that this soot or black carbon is very intensive 
during the dry season. During the rainy season, it disappears because it's rained down. The soot, contrary to other um, um, aerosols, is remaining in the air only two weeks, six weeks. If it's raining, it's coming down. It's being uh, mixed in with the, with the soil. Now, we have this situation. Now, here, this is another situation of the pyramid. The pyramid is a research station at 5,000 meters in the Himalayas. And what it shows here is the intensity of soot during the day. And you see that in the afternoon, the pollution at 5,100 meters is growing very rapidly, every day. And it is comparable to a mid-sized Indian city. Now, what is happening is that the valley winds, which are very strong in the Himalayas, they are carrying the, uh, the polluted air from the valleys up to the mountains and can be measured up to 5,000 meters. Then usually, in the, in the night, these valley winds go down and the soot is being deposited on the glaciers. And there's another phenomenon for increasing the, uh, the, the melting of, of the glaciers and, and, uh, and snow. Now, this uh, black carbon has become very relevant because UN, UNEP is saying that if we are tackling the black carbon, which doesn't need an international mitigation agreement, and which is partly also the product of regional uh, pollution. If we do so, we can reduce the increase of temperature in the next 50 years by half. So we can make a substantial contribution to mitigation till the long-term measures are kicking in. That is, that is the idea. But of course, it's not the solution in the long term. But it is very important because it's an important health issue in the, in the, in the households, in the, in the houses. And it is an important issue because it's reducing the productivity. Um, here you see also uh, research which has been done, uh, which shows that the content of uh, soot has been increasing uh, in the last 10 years very substantially. This is done by uh, the Chinese uh, mainly. Now, when we look at the future, it's becoming a little bit critical. Uh, for the details, I refer to the study. But according to the models, we are expecting actually more monsoon rain in the years to come, till 2080. And it is going to be more intensive in, uh, in eastern Himalaya and in central Himalaya and less in the western Himalaya. This is modeling. You have to take modeling for what modeling is. So whatever is happening, we are, we are we're going to have substantial water. The question is what we do with this water during the monsoon. But now the surprising thing is Ramanathan, who is saying, look, due to air pollution to the brown cloud, we will have a substantial weakening of the Indian monsoon. We will even have a receding of the monsoon towards north. And we have also, uh, the, in China, a change of the monsoon where it will uh, shift from, from, gradually shift from south. Now, these are models based on certain assumptions. It is not that this is going to happen like that, but it's, at present, it best signs. What it means for us is you, we have to be aware that looking into the future, we have a, a very substantial degree of uncertainty. What is going to happen? How it's going to happen? As I said, with the glaciers, they're melting. But some glaciers are growing due to climate change. So it is not a linear development. It's going to be contradictory, and it makes the, our explanation to the general public even more difficult. Now, what can be done? I think immediately we think we have to devise new approaches, a new strategy for water storage. The situation is so dramatic in India and also in Bangladesh that we have to make sure that the discharge of the rivers is more regular during the dry season. So we have to reconceive watershed management. We have to reconceive 
reservoir water harvesting, we, we could not exclude barrage, but it doesn't mean that we have to go for big uh, barrages. However, we have to look at innovative strategies so that we have partly market-driven mechanisms which are changing the situation. So with this, I would like to conclude. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.